I was a part of a successful TV show and was recognized almost everywhere I went. And I had made millions of dollars. I bought a Lamborghini for my 26th birthday. But the moment nobody cares and business gets tough, nobody cares and business gets tough. Yeah. Like nobody writes you a check to say, hey man, we're totally sorry about what happened. <laughs> business is tough right now, but you've done a lot of work in the past. You know, <laughs> yeah. just cash this and I think you'll be fine. It's like you have to stay aware and be learning and growing every single day yeah. or else you will get crushed. Yeah. And and I just think I wasn't I wasn't born with that mentality. I wasn't raised with that mentality. I was raised wanting to be better and wanting to succeed and wanting to keep growing. But I had no idea how much work that meant and what that really meant. Give us our daily bread. I want the whole basket. Cause I'm a hustle till I get it or I'm in a casket. Passionate for providing value in every way. Not cashing in for providing value every day. Paying it forward, right thing, I'll do it till I'm dead. I hope you're hungry cause it's time for the daily bread. What's up, everybody? This is Tyler Harris. This is the Breadwinner Podcast. Today, we've got the uh, the pleasure of being in the office, <laughs> office, in the studio, office studio here at Young and Reckless with Mr. Christopher Drama Path. Yes, sir. And uh, I'm excited, man, to meet you yeah. in person. I was telling TJ on the way here, we were driving over from uh, LAX, and I was like, man, I'm thinking back to like I used. To, Robin Big was one of my favorite, favorite shows. Yeah, me too. Uh, I don't know what it is. Like, I think that there's, like, this inner, like, Rob Durdick inside me. Because, in like, of... at my house, like, my wife, it drives her nuts because I I'll just sing everything. Yeah. Just, like, for no reason. That's just, like, she'd be like, she'd be like, hey, take the trash out. I'd be like, you want me to take the trash out? <laughs> like, just for no reason, you yep. know? Like, yep. and, and, and when I saw him doing that, and, and honestly, that show, I was like, this is... A dude that is literally making a living just having what seemed to be the most fun yeah ever yep and and so the man the opportunity to get to meet you here and talk about all the things that you've done um, since then which was the very beginning yeah. and kind of helped you launch all the things that you've done today man I couldn't be more excited to have you on um, but for those of you that don't know uh, Chris if you want to give a, uh, a quick intro yeah. uh, of who you are where you're from, yep. and really what kind of what your main focus is right now. We'll kind of go from there. Yeah, the quick version of it is I am, uh, my name's Chris Paff. My nickname's Drama, which got very, very uh, well known courtesy of MTV in about, I think it was 2008 or seven. Um, from Akron, Ohio, born and raised. Had an extreme passion for skateboarding. Um, that's what led me to moving to LA. LA is like the skateboard capital of the world. Yeah. So I kind of, from like 14 on, I knew the moment I graduate, I'm going straight to LA. Um, I pretty much did that. Had a bad head injury in Ohio, skating uh, before I, so it delayed my trip a few months, but moved to LA. Um, ended up becoming really close with my cousin Rob, who's the superstar. Uh, hilarious TV personality. Um, and the cool thing was like, we didn't, I would say we knew, I knew who he was growing up, but he's I think 13 years older than me and he yeah. moved to LA when he was 16. So I never really knew him. Like, you know, we'd see each other every, probably two or three times at like a Christmas or something. Mm -hmm. But when I came out to LA, I knew that he was obviously out here. He was a skateboarder also. And luckily we just ended up becoming really close. And he literally became like a big brother to me and yeah. still is, right? Yeah. And. Um, so then that turned into shooting a pilot for some crazy reality TV show concept. Mm -hmm. That ended up being Robin Big, which was a smash success, massive success. Yeah. Um, that rolled into a show called Fantasy Factory on MTV. Um, that rolled into me being able to launch uh, my clothing brand, Young and Reckless. Um, and that's mainly what I focus on today, is Young and Reckless, that's my real passion. And ever since really day one, I think, my goal has always been to own a business and you know be an entrepreneur and build a life in LA where I could sustain and have a good life in my mm -hmm. dream city. And um, I'm able to do that now and, and I'm just really happy about it. And I've also tried a million, I have a, some other insight that I'm sure we'll get into, but I've tried and failed and succeeded and had different experiences in different businesses. I don't think that this is necessarily my end all, you know, end of the story. I, I really want to continue building and growing businesses. Yeah. Um, 
and now I'm getting into podcasting and we're talking about creating content and just trying to kind of take what I've now learned. Now it's crazy to think, but it's been, you know, 12 years. And I've been through everything from small town to reality TV to all this different stuff, building brands. And now I'm just trying to figure out the best way to kind of share that to as many people as possible. That's awesome, man. It, do you ever sit here in this office and you kind of look out into the hills over here and you think like, how does a kid from Akron? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I do, but I think the weird thing about, just being honest, the weird thing about, like, our brains is, like, you have those moments of, like, man, who would have thought? You know, mm -hmm. this is crazy. And, and even, to be honest with you, this morning when I walked out of my place, I just, it was a nice morning, the weather yeah. was great, and I just kind of thought to myself, like, it's so cool that, like, I'm financially fine mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. I have a life built. I have friends. I have, like, that's crazy. Yeah. So all the other stuff is great. It's a bonus, but... It's crazy that this is where I really call home and like know people and have been to now weddings and you yeah. know and just all these different things and this is my life and yeah it's it's uh it's cool but the problem is the entire rest of the days is like let's go 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 yeah. you know so I try to balance that as much as I can. And the other thing too though is like the nice thing about when you've put an insane amount of work in it's like in that same moment where you're like, how did a kid from Akron get here? You're like, no, like this, yeah. make, this makes sense. Yeah. Like because of the work that's gone yeah. into it. Yeah. That's 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 what I love about seeing people that have earned it. Yeah. <laughs> like 100%. because it would be very easy to say that and you're like, really? I mean, how did I, yeah. how did I get <laughs> here? But but when you know the hours and the years that have gone into it, like no one no one puts you on that show yeah. and said, hey, now this is your opportunity to launch a brand. And oh, oh yeah, yeah, by the way, there's going to be thousands and thousands of hours that'll go into actually building that brand. Yeah. And then you'll be sitting here one day saying that. That's the nice thing, man. Yeah, it's cool, man. And it's like I've learned so much. And like I have been very fortunate. And you know that's why one of the main things that I tell people is like, you gotta go for it and you're gonna find people to help you build what you're already building. But no one's gonna create anything for yeah. you. And even like, I, I, it's embarrassing to admit, but the first week, month, six months that I lived in LA, I was scared shitless. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like I just, mm -hmm. it's just so different than where yeah. I'm from. I'm from a pretty small part outside of Akron, Ohio. And it's just different. What's the town called? Well, Coventry, they kind of do it by townships okay. there, right? So yeah. Coventry Township. I lived in Hudson when I was a little kid. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. close. Yeah. I think Stowe and Twins 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's just, um, it just was such a change. And, like, I literally, the first week, I was like, I'm moving back. There's no way yeah. that I'm going to be able to. And it probably took a couple of years before I really felt like, you know, this was home and that was a way. But, um, yeah, it's been a journey, man. But I've been really fortunate and learned a lot of stuff on, along the way. Yeah. Know? So one of my favorite quotes, every successful person has a painful story. Yeah. And the part I always add on to that is, will your painful story have a successful ending? Uh, so what's one of those painful stories kind of uh, over the last 12 years um, that happened for you, not to you, and kind of made you who you are now? Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of them, like a whole lot of them. And I think that um, not, I guess this is my moment to kind of say the, oh, pity me thing, but I, you know, I'm not usually a fan of doing that. But I, what people don't realize is like, you know, I, uh, I was the younger brother of my family. My brother was always better than me at everything, right? So I was fighting to kind of get through that. Then I moved here and was fighting to make a place for myself. Then now this reality show takes off, fighting to make a name in there, fighting to start a brand. And so I've had a lot of ups and downs and a lot of gut punches and a yeah. lot of you know embarrassing situations and whatever. I think that the biggest one for me that I now look at as like a defining sort of time frame, it's more of a time frame. Mm -hmm. And it was probably a few years ago, and really to be honest, it was the combina it was this weird combination that I haven't figured out yet how to properly put into words. But it was my cousin who was like my big brother met his wife. Mm -hmm. And so now he's kind of tied up yeah. building that relationship. Yeah. Um, even Dee, my business partner, had really got serious with his wife and was tied up building that. Yeah. Um, we were done filming the show, which for me was a great thing because I didn't like going and performing on camera every day and there was, I didn't enjoy that. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't take into consideration was there was a family yeah, of crew true. members and it's literally like coming to an office every day for 10 years and one day just stopping. And you say like, oh, I'm gonna keep these relationships, I'm gonna do blah, 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 and you just, everyone's busy and yeah. you just don't realize the toll that that takes on you. And these are people, these are literally people that when I first moved here and we started filming, if I had a flu, I would call the production assistant <laughs> to schedule me a doctor's appointment, you know? Yeah. And it's insane. And not on some like diva stuff, but on some like, that was really like, 
you know, they were overly concerned about yeah. how we were and that we were healthy. And they were so thoughtful and knew how to take care of anything. And that's just kind of how my early life was built here. And so I underestimated that. I was had just gotten out of a, a pretty crappy relationship. And then this, the thing on top of all that was retail had just started to really get kicked in the face, yeah. right? And what that meant for us was we've always been really aggressive, been really lean, all that stuff. But it meant some very dramatic, very quick cutbacks. And it meant sitting with a lot of the people that I had been traveling the country with, building this brand, and became really good friends with, and firing them. Not yeah. because they did anything wrong, but because yeah. the industry changed. Mm -hmm. And it felt like for a while, there was like a six month period where it felt like every day I walked in these doors, the sky was collapsing and it was worst case scenario. And I felt so terrible. And I would go home every night, and I, I tell this story now that I'm comfortable telling it and that everything's going well. Yeah. I would wait until 9 p.m. because for some reason that was the time when I didn't have a problem and I would crack a bottle of wine, right? And I would just be at my house by myself chugging wine, like two bottles of wine a night, right? But as long as I waited until 9, and yeah. I would literally be That's like funny. waiting around my house watching like lock up until 9 and then and then have a drink. And, and just, it just felt like nothing, I mean, this sounds kind of dramatic, but like it felt like nothing was for anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like, why am I oh, even yeah. doing this? Yeah. I don't even feel like I had, I didn't feel like I had any friends. I didn't feel like I had any close relationships. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like, I felt like all girls were messed up. I felt like business was unfair. And it rocked me, man. Yeah. But, but I think that luckily for whatever reason, I don't know the reason. There is a part of me that for lack of a better way to say it, just refuses to be a loser. Mm -hmm. I just won't be a loser. Mm -hmm. And so that meant like you gotta it sounds figure like the out. title of your next book. Yeah, like just don't be a loser. <laughs> just don't yeah. be a loser. And literally, like that's <laughs> that's always been my thing. Is like I just won't be that guy. Like what am I gonna do? Be the guy that just drank too much and had to move back to Ohio? Like yeah. I won't. Yeah. And so that led me to, you know, the first bit of progress, the second bit of progress, strengthening kind of how I look at things, getting through the tough part and dealing with it of the business and really working on myself, mm -hmm. you know, and realizing that I had had some pretty insane success pretty early. Yeah. Because what happens is at 25 years old, when you're on a television show and so people are recognizing you everywhere you go, you're making millions of dollars from this company that you built essentially yourself, right? Like outside of that was obviously D. Yeah. So now you have this like fuel to any ego that you have, you're making money. It's literally like you're on top of the world. Yeah. And all it takes is a couple times of not knowing what to look out for or whatever happened mm -hmm. and keeping yourself in check and you can get slapped really hard yeah and i think that that really taught me like look man good job like you came here you worked you whatever but like let's chill out a little bit and yeah. learn how to really do this yeah and that was that moment for me and, and i started then you know i read a book called 10 percent happier about meditation started dabbling in meditation uh started dabbling and trying to figure out D runs. My business partner mm -hmm. runs nonstop. Yeah. Started trying to run, it was miserable. I started going to Soul Cycle. I gotta talk to D today because I can't handle the Instagram stories with his life. Yeah, so <laughs> holding his gear. Man, they see Run Club. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the worst. But uh, I, I hate running, I hate everything about it. And so I just literally worked through trial and error, all these different things, dealt with what I had to deal with. And, and I can say now that because of that, I'm in such a better, place yeah. than I was before. And I I feel like I know why I'm here. I know how to control it. I don't want it to happen, but worst case scenario could happen tomorrow. Mm. I'll be able to deal with it. Uh, it just, it made me such a more thorough human being, you know? That's an awesome story. I told this story once, but it was a very, very condensed version on one of the first podcasts. You know Gerard Adams? Mm -hmm. um, it was one that we did up with him up in New York. and. Um, but I was driving, I was leaving work. My wife had gone up to Asheville, North Carolina, up in the mountains, and I was headed up there after work to meet up with her, and we are staying with her family and grilling out that night, and I'm driving up there, and I'm driving through the mountains, and I always lose service in this one, like, 20-minute section. Yeah. And I was up there, and I just had a really bad month, week, day, and just all that stuff. Just, like you said, that moment of, like, why am I doing this? Yeah. Or what am I supposed to be doing? Because what I was doing, I was very successful in doing it, but I'm like, I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, yeah. I don't know if this is what my talents and skills are supposed to be used towards. And, and I remember like, I just started praying. And, yep. and like not like the you know nice, like, you know, 
yeah. pretty praying, like yeah. the ugly crying praying, yeah. you know. Yeah. And and I told I was I was just like I need I need you to tell me right now what am I supposed to be doing? And I had been texting with my wife on the way up, and and we have a 20 month old uh, daughter, and she had been uh, a handful that day, and I was like, hey, you want me to grab some beer on the way uh, up? And she's like, yeah. Um, and I said her beer and tequila, mm-hmm. and and then that's when I lost service. And so I'm, I'm sitting there praying while I'm driving. I'm like, I need you to show me right now, right now, what am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. And it was right when I came up on the other side of the mountain and got service back. Is right when I said, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Tell me right now. My phone by rips. That very second, mm-hmm. I look at it. She's responding to the beer and tequila hadn't used this phrase in forever she said preach mm-hmm. and so i'm god tell me right now what am i supposed to be doing right now like yeah. preach yeah. i'm like <laughs> yeah come again <laughs> excuse me too perfect and and so i get back to the house i'm like and at the time at the time my wife and i were in the process of starting a church with this group and that wouldn't be that far-fetched, mm-hmm. but it would be extremely far-fetched mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. But it, it wouldn't be that far-fetched in the realm of, like, where would that come from? Yeah. I told my wife about it, and she's like, well, you're not going to be a preacher. And I'm like, I don't think that's what it meant. Yeah. And it wasn't until about six, seven months later, I realized it didn't say be a preacher. Mm-hmm. It just said preach. Mm-hmm. You can preach from any platform. Yeah. And social media happened to be that platform yeah. for me. Because it was just six months prior to that that I had started building my personal brand online and starting to do this vlog and podcasts and all this stuff. And had really started to get these messages from people and like how it's changed their life and all the like crazy, crazy messages that we get. Um, And to see that kind of come to fruition of like, oh, that's what you're supposed to be doing is just preach, meaning just put a message out on a platform that'll reach people and it'll impact them. And man, those moments, they're so powerful it's almost like you feel tj and i talk all the time about the fact that we wish there was a course you could take in school he's like come take my course and in 90 days we're going to destroy your life yeah. just destroy yeah. family friends yep. everything we're just going to destroy it that way you can build it back up and you're good like because i'd rather it happen at 25 than 55 yeah. you know um but we have so many people that they just go through life and they haven't had that many Scenarios like that where they're just sitting there like, what am I supposed to be doing? Why why do I feel like I'm not moving in the right direction right now? Yeah. And those are the biggest growing periods of time for anybody's life. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was for me. Um, 100%. I think that, you know, even me, for instance, like I was, I was always pretty driven. And that's cool. And I, and I always, like I said, this whole don't be a loser thing, I've, I've never wanted to be a loser. And I've always tried to like <laughs> educate myself. And I've always been like, it wasn't until I was faced with, with that like sort of darkness of it all oh, yeah. that it really led me to audit and like rethink and rebuild. And now I have that same drive, but stacked with actual you know, tools and actual a deeper knowledge and, and whatever. But yeah. the thing for me is I just, I want to like set an alert on my phone to like fake, you know, like simulate a meltdown. You know, yeah. kind of like what you're saying. Oh, yeah. But like, how do you, you know, it's almost like we, we search so hard to like be comfortable. Mm-hmm. And when we find that comfort, we, we tend to not move. And, and that's when the doom is coming. You yeah. know what I mean? And, yeah. and it's almost like, how could you just set an alert that says like, hey, don't forget. Like, <laughs> it's right behind you. You know, and like, yeah. oh, shit, okay, don't what do I need to do? Tell your wife to leave you tomorrow. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how can I like simulate it? Yeah, because yeah. like, you need to, in the most comfort is when you really need to like, audit and mm-hmm. sort of shift and whatever. but. You know, it's instinctual. So that's that's. I hope that I can take a piece of that and sort of continue to do that forever. I'm just thinking, like this whole premise of this book, I think it may, it may actually be genius. But don't just be a loser. Like, book. Just like at every moment in your life, just ask yourself, like, what would the non-loser version yeah. of me do? Yeah, like, like, are you being the loser? <laughs> you are you being the winner? <laughs> so, I, so how did you and D meet? Uh, we met because. Oh, this, this is a story. great story. Yeah. Did he tell you? No. Nah. Oh man. Okay. So he was. He had a relationship or friendship with um my cousin's manager i think okay. it was and so whatever he was just like as well as like you know i knew people from dc shoes and i knew all this and he was you know someone that i knew and um but this is how we how i got to know him at all is 
when I was on Robin Big, so Robin Big only did three seasons. It was this massive hit show. The problem was, at a total, I was probably on like seven or eight episodes, mm -hmm. right? And I wasn't making any money from the show. Uh, I was just making the little bit of money that I was making being Rob's assistant. And so I saw Rob making millions of dollars and renegotiating contracts and all this stuff for DC and all yeah. these people. And then I saw Big Black launch a clothing line and that did millions of dollars in business. And I thought, man, I can get something. Like there has to be something that I could get. And so I went around and met with everyone, um, including like Echo and everyone that I could meet with mm. to try to get $500 a month to wear it on whatever else featured on the yeah. show and I would do anything for you. <laughs> and one of the people I met with was D for 5'4". Awesome. And I said, hey man, you know, I'm on this show and if you give me 500 bucks a month, I'll do anything. And they were like, oh, we don't really do that. You know? And I was like, man, like a third in this line. This before influencer marketing was. Oh, uh, 100%. And I just crazy. wasn't big enough. Nobody cared. You know, and I think that like I ended up doing a couple things with like, Echo. You can be working in the fast food restaurant yeah, episode when exactly, you do this. Exactly. Like, do we get prime time? <laughs> and so I, um, I think I ended up doing something with Echo where I did like 200 bucks a month for like three months or something. But... Um, the funny thing is, I always joke with him, like, man, if you would've just paid me 500 bucks, I probably never would've started Young and Reckless because that was part of the fuel, you know? It was like, nobody will, sure. you know, will um, will pay me to wear their stuff, so I'm just gonna have to start selling my own stuff. And then when it came time to, so we didn't really talk or anything, when it came time to start Young and Reckless, I went and met with everyone that I knew um, in clothing again, and, and he was one of the people, and obviously, mm -hmm. You know him now, he's a great guy and yeah. saw the vision, was very like flexible, able to kind of figure it out with me. And uh, it just ended up being perfect. And there was something that happened there with getting the brand, something that happened with the first few episodes or was it the first season mm -hmm. of Fantasy Factory? Something where you couldn't put it out there? Yep, so the way it went down was this. I was brainstorming on like, okay, how can I sell my own stuff, right? And then they, they picked up Fantasy Factory, and they said they wanted to do Fantasy Factory. So at the time, Big Black had moved to Texas to, to raise his daughter. And so it was just Rob and I. So I'm like, all right, well now I'm second in line, so I'm definitely, this is my chance. So I'm working, working, working. Obviously I take it to Rob, he doesn't have enough time to help me with it. I'm like, man, so I go meet with Dee and all them, blah, blah, blah. Come up with the name Young and Reckless, start working on the logos. The point is, by the time I had gotten the logos and everything, I was working on the trademark when we started shooting the first season, but MTV is not going to take a risk letting me wear anything <laughs> that isn't trademarked yeah. and owned 100% by me. So I missed it and I couldn't wear it on the first season and oh, I was devastated. Season. And I was like, man, there goes my chance. Yeah. Like I just blew it. Because mm -hmm. you don't know at that time, you're well, literally... Another season. No, you're checking ratings the next morning. Yeah. Every, every day after it airs, you get the ratings the next morning. You're hoping that they're growing or staying flat, you're hoping you don't get the call that you're canceled, you have yeah. no idea. So um, I was thought I blew it. Sure enough, thankfully it worked. We came around for the second season. By that time I was ready. Yeah. We printed up samples, I put it all over my office, and, and I got really lucky. This is the part of the story that a lot of people don't know. It's where I really got lucky. Sure, I got lucky that I was on a TV show and all that stuff, but I don't consider that luck because I, I was along for the entire ride, right? I, got, I was part of it. Yep. The luck was MTV called after the first season. They would always send us notes, like, hey, this is what we think the audience is wondering, so think about this when you're filming. One of the notes was, what is drama doing? Like, we know he doesn't work for you anymore. We know he, like, what is he doing yeah. there? You know, and I, we know he's your cousin, but like, can we give him a storyline? And that literally was right when I had Young and Reckless ready, and I, and I was like, I have a storyline awesome. for you. And that's when it started with, we did that episode with me sitting in the office in my closet, staring at the wall, and Rob took me to go get motivated and all yeah. this stuff, because it was literally like, what is drama doing? Like, let's show. <laughs> and then sure enough, my response to that was, I have, I printed out fake line sheets and all this stuff and plastered them all over the wall of my little office. I'm like, this is my thing, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. And it just worked perfectly with the story, you know? Now, I'm trying to think back to the show. There was was it was it called the Hands of God? Oh yeah. It's, was that that was before, was that the first season before yeah, this? That was the first season. 
So here's what happened. I had, <laughs> I, my first thing was this. So the moment I landed here, I was like, I gotta figure out my thing. Yeah. And then I saw obviously that, you know, now we're doing this show and now there's all this opportunity. So you have this platform, but like, what the hell is my thing? Yeah, like, cause yeah. I know this is gonna come and go and everyone's gonna be doing well and I'm gonna be out here doing club appearances, right? <laughs> and, and so I'm like, I gotta think of something. So my first thing was music production. And so I took all the money that, you know when you're young and your family gives you birthday money and your parents yeah. put it away for college? Yeah. I knew I had one of those. <laughs> and so I called my mom, obviously I'm not going to college. So I called my mom, I'm like, mom, how much is in that thing, you know, that we do? And she's like, oh, I think there's like 800 bucks. Or yeah. I'm like, send it, like you have to send it. I'm gonna buy a keyboard. Cause I had yes. just learned that with a keyboard you could make beats. Yeah. And I'm like, mom, you have to send it, you have to send it. And so thankfully she gave up on college also in that moment and sent me the money. I went to Guitar Center, bought this keyboard, set it up in my room, and would just make beats, make beats, make beats. I grew up playing the drums, so I kind of knew the okay. basics. My next hustle was I would give the beats to the executive producers of the show and beg them, like, please, I'm just a broke 19-year-old from Ohio, please put this as the background music on the show. So if ever one day comes, that an old Robin Big episode comes on TV, just pay attention. Like, when you come back from yeah. commercial, if you hear a terrible, <laughs> terrible noise that sounds like a broken phone's ringtone, that's a drama beat, right? And so I'm like, this is it. Like, I'm signed up for ASCAP, I'm gonna be rich, blah, blah, blah. And I'm making beats, I'm giving it that. And, um, and so, in the interim, that was really my focus when Robin Big went off and Fantasy Factory started. And so my thing for Fantasy Factory was, I'm this is my chance, this is my first hustle. I'm gonna spend all my money and I'm gonna build a studio in there. And I'm gonna go get the equipment and I'm gonna whatever and this is it, like mm. I'm taking off. And so yeah. I wanted to do Young and Reckless, that was in my mind, but this was now my thing. So okay, I'm drama, beats, I got the Young and Reckless, this is my, I'm pretty much, P. Diddy, right? Yeah, clearly. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so then that's how that was born. And then of course, I gotta give it to Rob on that. Like, he took my idea yeah. of a studio in the Fantasy Factory yeah. and just <laughs> put it on, you know, on, on mushrooms, we'll say. Uh, yeah, and, uh, right. and it turned into, the, oh, well, the soundboard has to be a spaceship. And when people are waiting, they're in the hands of God because they're waiting to get left by God. And there's, there's a cave where you walk through to go to the booth. And I'm like, all right, dude, this is your building. You do whatever the hell you want. I just want a place to record and whatever. So that's awesome. Yeah, that was my first uh, yeah, thing. When, um, when Chris Boykin died. Yeah. I did a long post about on Instagram, and because I, I had done a bunch of research on his life around that time, yeah, and it's so impressive what he did. Yeah, I mean, if you think about moving from up north to was it Mississippi? Yep. Mississippi, and then all Chicago. The, oh yeah, Chicago to Mississippi, Indiana. and all the stuff he had to deal with there. And I remember reading these stories about how he realized that he needed to become funny so he could fit in and yeah. and, and be um, in rural. Southern Mississippi yep. and all that was going on, and then did the you fact that our he, I did, I did, and the fact that he had <clears throat> he had a football scholarship, and he went to the Navy, and then he goes to start this bodyguard or um, yeah bodyguard bouncing yep. uh, business, and then the part that I loved was the fact that when he died, he was worth millions, yeah, and he came from nothing. And he left it, and he left it for his daughter. Like to me, it was just the coolest, coolest, coolest story. Absolutely, and uh, such an impressive uh, thing to watch. Was, yeah, um, I, I owe so much of my. That was by far like, you know, I grew up obviously with uh, all four of my grandparents passed away when I was young when I lived in Ohio, and I was just so there were some like young family things that um, like affected me, but definitely without a question, as far as like phase two of my life goes, which is the LA part that was the one that like really affected me much more yeah. than I, you know, I don't want to say that I would have expected, but like really affected me like a family member mm -hmm. because when I moved here, literally, I walked into, Rob picked me up from the airport and I went to his house first and it was him and Big Black there barbecuing and yeah. whatever. And so through the whole process of Rob and Big and then when he came back for Fancy Factory, he was like, I mean, there was so much like advice and guidance and and like even problems with like girls and stuff. Yeah. He would give me advice on, yeah. you know, and like just also just leading by example and seeing mm. the way he dealt with things and yeah. and um, yeah, he was a special special guy. And obviously, that resonated really well on TV, yeah. meaning he affected a lot of people's yeah. lives and made a lot of people happier yeah. and whatever. But um, 
Oh yeah, man. He was a special, special dude. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So over this last 12 years, what's one thing that you can think of that you quit doing that you think helped you to succeed or enabled you to succeed? Over the last 12 years? Yeah, or just in general, but just especially over these last, yep. uh, probably over the last few, really. Last few, really, yeah. Because yeah. I think that, um, you know, like I said, the way that I see it is I was always driven. I was always entrepreneurial. I was always doing yard sales and making skate videos and trying to sell them and doing anything I could to, like, just get it going, you know, and, and moving to L.A. And, you know, I, I started a business and did all this stuff kind of just out of, like, to be honest, like instinct and drive, right? And then, like I said, I hit that bit of a wall, and, and that's what really made me kind of look at everything I was doing and, and try to be way smarter. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, to kind of, no pun intended, put a long story short, is like, what you don't realize is when you're born, you have to look at, like, your childhood and where you come from and, you know, how, what, at what level do your parents achieve? And is that in line? Who cares? Some people like to just relax. Some people want to be really rich, whatever. Mm -hmm. My point is, I'm not judging. My point is, were you raised with the real lessons that it takes to become really successful? Were you raised with those habits? Were you raised with that discipline? Yeah. Um, the school system that you went to, did that teach you that? What does everyone else do? Like, let's just be really honest and look at how you've been trained to think and live every single day. And is that in line with where you want to go? Mm -hmm. And for me, that answer was a loud and clear no. Yeah. And there was a lot of things that I wasn't doing that were just discipline issues. And I think that, you know, there's, a, I can literally go on and on about this topic, but I now, from three years ago, when I first hit like a, that real rough patch to now, I mean, I, li I used to smoke cigarettes. It's the dumbest shit in the world, right? <laughs> I, I, uh, by nature, and not that I've ever even through that period, I wouldn't consider like, I would never consider myself like an alcoholic in that period, but like, mm -hmm. because of that by nature, you're drinking less. Because yeah. of that by nature, I'm waking up earlier. I now have systems to track that I do the bare minimum every day, drink the right amount of water, yeah. text my mom, um, stretch, whatever, meditate. Yeah. I have all these systems in place and all these things, and then I do gratitude journals, and I yeah. do like little things to just work on habits and make sure that you're setting yourself up to succeed in any given day and also realizing that absolutely nothing is promised or owed to you or anything every day and the one thing that I learned I'll tell you this through that hard patch is I was a part of a successful TV show and was recognized almost everywhere I went and I had made millions of dollars I bought a Lamborghini for my 26th birthday but the moment nobody cares and business gets tough, nobody cares and business gets tough. Yeah. Like nobody writes you a check to say, hey man, we're totally sorry about what happened. <laughs> business is tough right now, but you've done a lot of work in the past. <laughs> yeah. You know, just cash this That's and true. I think you'll be fine. It's like, you have to stay aware and be learning and growing every single day yeah. or else you will get crushed. Yeah. And, and I just think I wasn't, I wasn't born with that mentality. I wasn't raised with that mentality. I was raised wanting to be better and wanting to succeed and wanting to keep growing, but I had no idea how much work that meant and what yeah. that really meant. And so there's a million things. In the last few years, yeah. I literally am like a totally different person. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I love, I love how you said that about, about no one really even, not that they don't care, but that they're certainly not gonna pay you for what you did do. Well, and they don't care, meaning, I don't mean it in like a, yeah, that hurts way. I'm meaning like everyone has their issues, yeah. you know, everyone has their stuff to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was compensated for the work I did yeah. uh, that day. Yeah, yeah. Then what are you gonna do the next day? You know, it's not like, I, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. And so it's kind of like, it, it, I just like, I don't wanna turn anyone off with, the, with like bold statements like that, but I do think it's important to say like, look, it just is what it is, mm -hmm. nobody cares. You yeah. can work for 10 years and work really, really, really hard and build a great thing. But if you stop in the 11th year, Nobody cares to come save it for you, yeah. you know? And if you don't stop, you're gonna be greatly rewarded. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and you're gonna get more than what you deserve if yeah. you keep pushing. But if you don't, then great. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I, I own a life insurance company, and mm -hmm. so we've got about 80 life insurance agents across the country in pretty much all states. And, and when people do well, they progress into become managers, leaders, and they get a team. And, mm -hmm. and we do these trainings with the team and I try to explain to them like the only way I know how to lead is by example. Mm -hmm. It's the only way. And 
it's all about current credibility. And what I try to explain to, to our leaders is, this isn't the NBA. You didn't play for 15 years, mm -hmm. become an MVP, retire, now you're coaching, and you can base all of your credibility off of what you did in the league. Mm -hmm. Like none of us here are NBA players. Mm -hmm. Like it's based off of what you did yesterday, yeah. what you're doing today. Um, so with us, like we're very competitive. Like we have top tens every week for production. I'm like if you're not in the top ten in production, your team's seeing that, yeah. and it only takes so many times for them to see you not on the top ten. They may even see themselves on there when you're not on there. To where you lose all credibility. Yeah. And so we have. I mean, we're just so strong in this meritocracy. It's like. I don't care how many policies you sold yeah. last year. Like, yeah. it, it really doesn't, it's a new year. It really doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, and the only way you can tell somebody to do something or, or lead somebody to do something is by doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people just don't. And, and what I also explain to them is like, I get it, that sucks. Mm -hmm. It does suck. It sucks. Like when you're in year six, year seven, year eight, like it sucks, but it is what it is. Yeah. It's like you said, like, I. I don't know what else to tell you. Like it's just like it's it's the game that we're in, and but I think that that drives certain people and that cripples others mm -hmm. when they know that no matter how good last month was, that they got to get up and, and yeah. do it all over again. I agree. I, I just think the thing that I see that I wish I don't think I can change the world or anything like that, but I I think that the thing that I see that's so clearly just a shame is it does suck. But really the only reason why it sucks is because we're trained to think a different way. For whatever reason, and it's, I don't think that it's nature, because in nature, you have to fight for your life every day, right? So I don't think it's from there. Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying is for whatever reason, we are trained to think that you can work kind of hard, you deserve the world, mm -hmm. and if you work kind of hard for a little bit, man, you're gonna get the world, and then you get, just get to relax. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that expectation is put into our heads from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think the reality of what it takes to live the life that you wanna live, for some reason, is not what we're taught. And then you put on top of that that everything that we learn in school is just not really, I'm not completely bashing school, but it's not the right education for life. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's literally like playing, taking soccer lessons to play football. It's like, it's kind of similar. Yeah. You know, there's goals and yeah. end zones yeah, yeah. and like, yeah, you work hard and you score. <laughs> but like, it's literally not the same lessons, not the right approach, not whatever. And yeah. so I do feel bad for people because everyone wants to do good. You know, you might not need to be a millionaire or need to live, to, live in LA, yeah. but you want to do good, you want to progress, you want to make people proud. We're just not taught how to properly do that and yeah. we're given these wrong set of expectations and that just destroys people. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel bad for that. And I think that's something that on a small level, I can help say, hey, hey, I, I realized some stuff yeah. in these, these 12 years of just craziness. Mm -hmm. that, you know, and, and let me just try to help pass that on. Because if I was on that flight from Ohio to LA and I could listen to my podcast or listen to whatever, mm -hmm. I, would, I think I would have hit the ground with a little bit different yeah. mentality, you know? Yeah. And the key to is the way you can change the world is by sharing those stories like what happened three years ago with you. Yep. And getting to that moment and having gotten through that because there's someone out there right now that's listening to this podcast that they're in that right now. Absolutely. And they think they're on an island. They think they're all by themselves. And for them to hear from someone that, oh, wait, I'm not the only one that thinks these things. Oh, wait, I'm not the only one that's gone through these things. Or, yep. and, and a lot of times it's the ones that have had great success that are the hardest to reach in that. Yeah. Because they do have all the answers. Right? Absolutely. Like they've got the, I mean, my favorite line is you can't feed your family and your ego at the same time. Yeah. It's uh, but so it's, true. it's, but it's, it is true. And, and it's, it's sometimes those that are the hardest to reach with that message. But that's why in the last topic I wanted to go over with you real quick, moving into podcasting. Mm -hmm. So you've got short story, uh, long, you've got uh, as a group chat with mm -hmm. D. Um, what, what's that evolution been like and kind of something that's completely different than anything that you've done before. Yep. Um, have you enjoyed that process? Mm -hmm. So to segue to, I'll kind of say that like, you know, I realize how important it is to now be talking about this stuff. And that's part of what Short Story Long is yeah. all about. And, and I'll say, to be honest, for me, like I couldn't talk about it for the first, you know, um, six years because I didn't know it yet. And then I couldn't talk about it for the last three because I wasn't out of the woods yet, you know? And it's like, yeah. thankfully, now, thankfully, 
the team morale is better than ever. Everyone's happier than ever. This year will be our biggest year that we've ever had, and we've underwent an insane shift from retail to e-commerce. Yeah. Um, product, everything is so much better, and I ha so now I can say, man, I went through a rough time. Yeah. But when you're climbing out of the swamp, you don't want to be like, man, I, that was rough, and then like, ah, oh, you get sucked back yeah. in, right? Oh, yeah. And so I'm finally now where I can say, hey, I learned the lesson, I regrouped, I did this, and that's really what the podcast and the content in general was all about. And really, what it came down to was I had been on. So there's a gift and a curse that happens here. Like, I had been on TV for uh, for eight or nine years and was on hit television shows and was reaching millions of people and built up followers on social media and all this stuff. The problem was, so that's the great thing. It allowed me to help, help me launch a brand, did yeah. so much for me. The bad thing is you're known for something that isn't in line with who you like are or where you're going, yeah. you know? And it kind of became, I love it and I loved every minute of it, but it became my character to be the naysayer. And to be the standoffish one and to be the one that thinks Rob's crazy. And that works so many times in things we were shooting. You know, he'd, yeah. they'd be like, hey, Rob's going to come in. He's going to be wearing a crazy outfit. Just do your thing. You know, and I'd be like, all right. And he'd come in and I'd be like, what are you doing, dude? You're crazy. You know, and that became, and that became the role. And I loved it. And it worked so well. And it made a great television show. But the problem was I can't scale that. I can't go on and do more reality shows where I'm, uh, not myself. Yeah. I can't, there's yeah. nothing you can do. So at that time, it was about two years ago when I really started my podcast. And that was the first thing where I said, hey, I'm going to really buckle down and do this. And that was me doing some soul searching and saying, I want to put out content that's in line with who I am and what I can grow on. Well, who am I? What is my brand? Well, I'm, I'm not a pro skateboarder. I'm not even a clothing designer. I'm not someone who wants to change the fashion game. I'm not any of those things. Yeah. I'm really a kid who didn't go to college, who grew up in a small town with a high school education in Ohio, moved to LA, went for it, paid attention, was didn't humble, was loser. scrappy, didn't want to be a loser, and and did it to yeah. a degree. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong, haven't had my made it moment, I have a long way to go, but I am. I have accomplished what I think a lot of young people would want to figure out how to accomplish. Sure. And I realized that one of the biggest, so that's who I am, that's what I can build on. So I realized that one of the greatest gifts that I ever got wasn't being on an MTV show or doing this or doing that, it was seeing that I that I could do more than what I thought I could do. It was moving to LA, meeting people, becoming friends with people, relating to people that were doing really cool things. Yeah. And for instance, one of those people was Johan, who started Rogue Status with Rob on Rob and Big, and those were the shirts with all the guns on mm -hmm. it, you know? And I was like, man, this guy's so cool. Yeah. He doesn't have to be on TV. And he just gets to hang out in Venice and build a brand. And it's so yeah. cool. And meeting Ken Block from DC and meeting all these people. I'm like, man, I could be one of those people. And that's what really opened my eyes to like, I can do this too. I can have a life I never thought I could have. So what I said is, all right, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a podcast. Why? Because it's so easy. I can do it from my office, yep. upload it right away. Nobody's telling me what to do. Nobody, nothing. Serve it right to all my followers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit down with people that I think are impressive, cool, have self-made some cool stuff. And I'm going to ask them the truth about how they did it, struggles, ups and downs. Take me through the whole story. Because I want people to get to know them the same way I got to know those guys. See that it's attainable. Yeah. And then take away some little lessons. And hopefully I can spark a, a person that way mm -hmm. to say, man, like I heard this interview with Kyrie Irving and he's not that different from me when yeah. I, you know, I'm 15 and the way he was when he, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. And so it really started on that. And it's grown and evolved. It's still at the core is that. My little tagline that I just tell myself is humanize and advise, right? So I want to bring the journey down to human level. And then I want to give you some things that we've learned in the end. Um, and I've had the chance to interview some insane people. I've learned so much. I've built insane relationships. I absolutely love it. It's literally like almost content mixed with therapy for me. Yeah. Um, and it's helped so much. And, uh, and then that branched off into group chat with D. The point of that is, hey, we talk shit to each other all the time and talk about what's going on in the industry and we have some good connections and good inside information. Let's yeah. just share that. Yeah. Let's just have an educated conversation about what's going on in the world that we talk about and see if anyone likes it. And it's been great. Um, and other than that, just trying to do vlogs like you are and trying to do all this stuff because I realized we're just in an age. I came from quality over quantity, meaning yeah. We spent four million bucks on an episode of TV, filmed it over a week, put it out, it was insane. Yeah. Now you have to put out 
seven episodes for free in that yeah. same time frame <laughs> every day forever mm -hmm. no seasons and it's just the game has changed and but at the end of the day connecting with human beings is the only goal yeah. and it's the same the whole way across and no matter whether you're trying to sell music or or, or clothing or a message yeah. it's still you have to connect and so that's what I'm trying to do. I think what you're doing is so important when you talk about getting the truth out there and having people yep. tell the real stories. There's a guy, Sean Whalen, I'm not sure if you're uh, mm -hmm. familiar, he runs an organization called Lions Not Sheep, you should look it up. Um, he just came and he's someone I've been following for three years uh, on social media and uh, have now become friends. He just came and spoke at one of our conferences and when I had him on the podcast, it was like my second or third podcast. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, hey man, what's one thing, just like I asked you, what's one thing that you quit doing that helped you to succeed? Mm -hmm. And he said, lying. Mm -hmm. I said, about what? And he said, everything. Like every time I say it, I get chills because yeah, so he's just, as a man, you walk in, you say, hey, how you doing? Great. How you doing? Good. How you good? No complaints. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Everything's great. Meanwhile, you know, he's cheating on his wife, his, you know, kids hate him, his business is failing, mm -hmm. and he's barely, barely got his head above water. But I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, yeah. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. And it's so important for people to hear these stories of people that have had certain levels of success but to know that they still go through those things and that they have gone through those things and have come out of it. Mm -hmm. So that again, that person that's out on an island by themselves thinking that they're the only one in the world that's mm -hmm. ever gone through that can see that and see that, oh, Kyrie Irving, oh, I can relate to all these different people. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just the, like talking about the things that people don't normally yeah. talk about. Because um, I just don't. Sorry to cut you off. No, you're, I, you're good. I just think that like when I was growing up in Ohio, and this happens everywhere. This happens like literally probably 20 minutes outside of LA. But you're just kind of instilled with this mentality that that's not for you. Yeah. That like rich people, entrepreneurs, uh, celebrities, uh, athletes, any of these things just isn't for you. It's for them. We watch, they do that. And, and I think it's shocking how close Everyone That's is to this crazy, amazing life. Yeah. It's so close. It's not some crazy transformation and some blah, blah, blah. It's yeah. literally like, stop lying to yourself. Yeah. And really, it's like it's literally decision. these couple things can just set you on a path, yeah. you know, where you're doing podcasts talking about how crazy your life is mm -hmm. in, in no time. You know? And I think a lot of people, and, and when I started doing the vlog and all, it's like this, who am I complex? Yeah. Like, who am I? to hire a grown man. Oh yeah, I have that to the fullest. I mean, Still. like who, who, who am I, who am I? And I think everybody has that to some degree, uh, but it's those that are willing to say that and then still go and execute mm -hmm. on it. Um, who am I, well, I, we'll find out. <laughs> we'll, we'll find out and we'll see what happens. Uh, but you're right, it's so interesting the way you just said that because it's like those people on the outside looking in, that it's, it's that small decision or that mental shift mm -hmm. that's the only thing mm -hmm. It's, it's their believing that. Mm -hmm. If they just switch that belief, mm -hmm. that could change absolutely everything. And it may not, and again, like, like you said before, success to one person versus another, someone that wants to just hang out, someone that wants to you know, be in every intramural sports league mm -hmm. and be home at five o'clock every day and, and all that, if they're happy mm -hmm. then, and they don't complain, mm -hmm. then that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, some that want to attain in, insane levels of success, but whatever that is for that person, um, to know that it's possible yeah. uh, and to know that people that have done the same have gone through the same struggles as they have yeah. or have had the same mental blocks as they have. And I think this, like, I think, even this is what I would just argue, and, I, and this is where the who am I starts to hit me when I say stuff like this, um, because I don't ever want to feel like everyone needs fixed and I have this recipe. Mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is even like my parents who are perfectly like, they're meant to live in Ohio yep. and raise a family. They've been together since high school. Yep. This is what they were meant to do. They don't ever regret not moving yeah. to LA, but they still want to be better parents, better sure. cousins, better mm -hmm. aunts, better, and there's just, everyone wants to be better. Mm -hmm. And you, it's just the fact that like you can be, like you'd be shocked at how yeah. easy it is to be the world's best aunt, Yeah, you know, and, yeah. and mom, and this and that. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that I've just found such happiness from moving forward. 
and progressing. And it's one of those things where maybe I'm a little out of pocket, but I feel like I've found this thing. And everyone that I meet, people like you and all these people on the podcast have also found it. Yeah. And it's so awesome. It's like the world's best drug. Yeah. And you just want to share it with everyone. Yeah. And you're just like, trust me, man, you can move forward. You can be a better version yeah. of you. And you will be so much happier when you are. And I, and I just think like, that will that solves so many problems. Not world peace, not nothing. But man, I've seen so many people turn to drugs and to yeah. alcohol and to violence, and then you spiral, and now you're in jail, and now you're doing this, and now you're beating up your girlfriend, and whatever, getting a DUI, because you just didn't take the step forward, yeah. so life pulled you back yeah. downwards, right? Taking ownership. Man, I just wanna, I just think it's so cool. Like I just, I just literally, it's like I found this thing, and I'm like, I would never yeah. want to see this. Yeah, and, it, and and honestly, that makes it that much more attainable from a person that's looking to put out a message to reach somebody. It's like, you're not trying to reach somebody and change everything. You're yeah. just trying to reach somebody and create that one pivot that makes them a little bit better in that area. Yeah. That one pivot that makes them a little bit more focused in that other area. And knowing that those things will build upon and build yeah. upon and build upon, and that is how you ultimately change someone's life. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's so funny, like you don't even realize, like there's probably, I say probably, there's episodes of Robin Big mm -hmm. that I'm sure changed someone's life. And I'm that was sure. never the intent. I'm sure. And that was never the intent from the beginning. Like the scene where he walks in with a crazy costume on, and you're like, ah. Like there was probably something in that episode that someone was like, oh my God, that, oh, changed, changed, that changed my life. I one time and a friend, no funny idea. story, my friend was a rapper in New Orleans and he, uh, uh, currency for anyone that, uh, that is a huge rap fan, but he called me one day and was like, man, you guys are saving lives. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you guys just saved a man's life. I watched it. And I'm like, bro, what are you talking about? He's like, I was in the house. Like they were just in the hood somewhere in New Orleans, and these two guys were fighting. He's like, bro, they were like, like one guy was going out to grab the gun out of his trunk, whatever, and a scene came on on Robin Day, and they both stopped and were like, oh shit! And he's like, it literally diffused the entire situation. He's like, I'm not kidding you. I watched you say that. I'm like, that's crazy. That's awesome. But no, it's all those little moments that you don't realize. Uh, yeah. You just don't realize like the compounding effect. Of, of sort of everything, right? Yeah. Of not only your own life and how you manage yourself, but how that affects other people. Yeah. And so that one little thing leads to another thing, leads to another thing. And, you know, I, I think it was Jordan Peterson or somebody said something along the lines of like, if you, doing good is far greater than you imagine. Yeah. And doing bad is far worse than yeah. you imagine. It's and true. it snowballs into your whole life. And it's these people that, you know, say, just go clean up your room and see how that leads and mm -hmm. go do this and that. Make it's like, bed. man, one win. Yeah. It just, it's just, you gotta snowball one way or the other. You can either work a little bit and snowball wins, or you can lay back and let the snowball losses come oh, yeah. and, you know, I don't know. Absolutely. I can't think of any better way to, to end the podcast. There we go, man. man. Pretty much everybody can, they know where to find you, but yep. um, where can they find the podcast and some of the stuff that you're most passionate or focused on right now? Yeah, so my number one passion right now is the podcast, which is short story long, everywhere where podcasts are. Um, any updates or anything from me is on Instagram, which is just drama. Yeah. Um, and then youngandreckless.com is where all my clothes are. Uh, and that's it, man. You'll, yeah. you'll have don't way be a, too don't much. Don't be a time. loser. It's going to be hidden, hidden bookstores Someday. this fall. Yeah, <laughs> if I stop being a loser and writing. <laughs> yeah, right. What would the non-losers <laughs> yeah. version of you do? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So good. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate you, man, having us in here. Yeah, thank you and so much. And I appreciate the conversation. I just appreciate what you're doing. I love the fact that you shared that story uh, of what happened three years ago because yep. I know for a fact that's going to reach someone on this podcast that's going through that exact same thing. So. Uh, and those are the stories that need to get out there. Yeah. Like people need to know the real, uh, the real stuff, and that's the stuff that most people are afraid of sharing. So I appreciate your uh, willingness to do so. And I ain't scared. <laughs> he ain't scared, and he ain't a loser. <laughs> so with that, guys, this is the Breadwinner Podcast. I am your host. Tyler Harris, and we'll see you next time. What's up, guys? If you have not yet done so, please like my Facebook page. Then next to the like button, click following, which will bring a drop down. And when it says in the news feed, click see first. This will ensure that you will always see the content that we're pushing out. The last thing that we want to have happen is for us to put out content that you actually want to see, but you don't. So make sure that you hit see first and we'll see you next time.